and welcome again. So hi, hello. Okay, I think, I hope I'm live now. <laughs> okay, hello and welcome again. Uh, Microbe Hunter here. I hope that this works again. It's the first time that I'm trying it now in my s different channel. Okay, I think uh, I should be I should be live now. Hi, hello, <laughs> and uh, yes, welcome again to an, a Saturday microscopy live stream. Audio is okay, isn't this great? <laughs> okay, um, yeah, welcome again. Uh, this time it is not in my previous channel, but I'm now uh, streaming from my main Microbe Hunter channel. Yeah, because today I would like uh, to give you a little insight into the cell theory. So the style of the video is similar to the one um, in my other channel. But uh, today I want to talk a little bit uh, more about uh, yeah, biology it, um, as well. Of course, I'm going to show you again many things under the microscope. And look at this, all of these pieces of paper here. I prepared all of them. <laughs> and uh, that's what we have to go through. Or rather, that's my task uh, to go through. Through here, I prepared um, a little hopefully interesting biology lesson for you. Yeah, and I see that uh, many of you or some of you have already started uh, to write comments. Um, if you're new uh, to these uh, to this live stream, um, yeah, you feel free, please, uh, to post a comment. Um, I expect that there might be more viewers than in the previous uh, weeks and months because I'm streaming now from the channel where I have a pro approximately ninety thousand subscribers, which is four to five times as many as in the other channel yeah and if you um, basically want to write a comment please do so um, I will try to answer uh, your questions that you might have um, yeah and uh, it has been tradition always uh, at the beginning uh, during the first couple of minutes to quickly tell tell us please uh, from where you are from yeah and we've got already comments from all over the place um, yeah from Lebanon from Minnesota from the United Kingdom Netherlands California okay yeah so South Africa, the West Coast, the United States, uh, Glasgow in Scotland, and also from Vienna, Austria. Hi. Hi, everyone. Okay. So um, usually what I do is, is um, I usually give it around, um, I don't know, three or four minutes at the beginning until more and more people start to join in. This is usually the time when I do a little bit of small talk. Um, and then um, I usually dive in. And uh, what I want to do today is the following. I've uh, received several requests uh, from some of my viewers over the comments um, and also um, sometimes emails and uh, YouTube uh, chat comments that some people would like to know a little bit more about uh, some theoretical background um, of the things that I talk about. Um, normally when I uh, make live streams, um, it's usually about uh, microscopy techniques, uh, yeah, and I show you certain things, and uh, I will still do that today. But I want to place a stronger focus a little bit on, um, yeah, on the cell theory today. And why did I choose uh, that topic? Because. Um, yeah, I've been thinking um, if uh, there are people out there who don't know very much about biology, what topic is it that I would teach them or what would I share with them rather? And I said, well, that is actually the cell theory. And so what I've done today is, is I've uh, yeah um, prepared a few things here that I would like to show you. Um, and um, I also prepared, um, yeah, it's the first time I'm doing that, I prepared um, also a little bit uh, of tiny little um, yeah paper, paper sheets that um, I'm going to work uh, myself through here so that I have something to show you here um, as, as well um, yeah so um, so uh, hello from Indiana the Netherlands Kashmir okay uh, hello can I clean microscope slides with an ultrasonic cleaner yes yeah, so you see there are some technical uh, questions here as well um, today I want to talk, talk a little bit about, about biology but I do not want to completely ignore the questions yes uh, you can do that with an ultrasonic cleaner as well and as a matter of fact um, I'm thinking about ordering one myself so what I would like to do today is the following look um, when we talk about biology um, then there are a couple of uh, certain unifying theories in biology. So that these are basically theories that apply to all fields of biology. And we've got the gene theory here that basically states that proteins um, yeah, are made uh, for using the information of, on, from DNA. So the whole field of molecular biology is in here. Evolution explains how species are able to change over time. Homeostasis is about how organisms like us humans, how, are, how we are able to control our internal environment. So how do we control our body temperature, for example? Um, all living things do homeostasis. They have to control water balance. 
the laws of thermodynamics relates to energy, energy use in living things. And then there's, of course, also the cell theory, one of those uh, in big, important theories. Um, and today, what I'd like to do is I want to go back in time a little bit and tell you a, a little bit about also some of the people that were involved. And then, of course, um, <laughs> I'm going to... Um, not only do it theoretically, but um, I'm also going to do a little bit of, of microscopy here. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm very excited about this topic, even though I already know quite uh, about biology. Yes. Uh, also, what's your favorite theory for the development of the first cells on earth? Ah, yes. That's also an interesting one. Well, um, the, uh, about the first cells on earth, uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So these are basically the unifying theories, but today I would like to focus primarily on the cell theory. And what we do is the following. We, we turn time backwards a few hundred years. Um, and there was this little gen gentleman over here. Yeah, very important personality. Many of you might already know him. And that's uh, a Dutch um, yeah, scientist. Um, his name was Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. And uh, he was actually um, one of the earlier people, or maybe actually even the first uh, person um, to one of the earlier people um, who actually um, looked at things under his homemade microscope. He was actually making lenses and he was grinding lenses. He kept a lot of these things as also a secret and he put a lot of things under the microscope and he made some beautiful drawings. And I've got a few of them over here. Look at this here. This was one of the, the drawings that he made. Um, he published, of course, uh, yeah, um, his findings, he wrote letters, and he called them little animals, animal kills, as he called them. And um, by just looking at them right now, they look very similar to bacteria. Okay, um, so he was actually the first uh, person to, um, or probably the first person to make a microscope which was, which was sufficiently good to be actually able uh, to see cells. Because those bacteria here, even though he didn't know what bacteria were, he called them little animals, animalcules, well, these were actually already cells. And um, he made many of these drawings, uh, but he of course did not know yet that bacteria um, um, are actually, or can be the cause of diseases. He simply saw them, he saw them move around. So you see over here is a dotted line. Um, and uh, that's basically what we got uh, from that time. Of course, photography was not invented yet. Uh, so the only thing that we have is we have got a several sketches, but I would like to show you now, um, yeah, how bacteria, how spiral shaped bacteria look like under the microscope. Um, basically, this is what we're able to see these days. <laughs> yeah, I made this some time ago. Um, it's uh, from a water sample. You can see that those uh, bacteria, they move like a corkscrew um, um, and they move forward. And I got this uh, from a, yeah, a pond water sample where I had some decomposing material and all of a sudden those uh, 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 spiral shaped bacteria started to reproduce. And that's basically what I uh, was able to see. So we see that nowadays with modern technologies, we are able to see um, a lot of yeah things, uh, yeah, also movement. Um, and that's of course something that you're not able to capture in a drawing. Now, what does this have to do with the cell? theory. Well, even though he was one of the first people to see cells, bacteria being cells, he of course did not know the significance of those. And he um, also was not the person who actually came up with the word cell. Um, this was um, a, uh, a British scientist uh, whose name was Robert Hooke, and who basically then um, put also with his uh, better microscope, uh, many um, specimens under uh, the microscope, and he was able to see those regular structures of cork, which I would like to show you here as well. Okay. Um, um, so um, what I will do, um, as always, um, I will um, go back to the, the comments every now and then I would like to interrupt myself and I would like to answer those questions. If I do not answer all of your questions, uh, please do not be disappointed. Um, today, I would like to place a focus on those questions that actually relate a little bit to the cell theory. So I would like to skip over a little bit um, yeah, questions that are a little bit more in the technical nature, which uh, are not so much related uh, to the cell theory. How do cells know when and how to duplicate? Oh, this this is a very good question and I think uh, one that I definitely have to, uh, to answer. Um, later on, I'm going to talk about cell division as well. In a very, very short, uh, simple explanation, as the cell grows in size, the volume of course increases and this causes the concentration of certain proteins to drop. There are certain proteins in a cell, um, certain chemicals in a cell 
that are constant in amount. But when the volume increases, then the concentration drops. And if the concentration drops beneath a certain critical level, then this is a chemical, chemical signal to the cell to start to divide. So in other words, the question of how does the cell measure its own size is indeed a very um, yeah, researched area. And uh, the current or one of the current ways of uh, explaining this is, is, um, is that the cell is able to measure the concentration of certain substances um, inside uh, the cell. Okay. So um, the next one, uh, the evolution is the most confusing part of my study. Yeah, uh, the theory of evolution is a, a big topic. Um, maybe, um, yeah, I don't know if I'm able to find a lot of uh, um, microscopy related uh, content uh, to that. But uh, the theory of evolution, of course, being also one of those big unifying theories that there are. Okay. So yes, we've got again, uh, hello from Texas, the Netherlands, Amsterdam. Yeah. <laughs> and those uh, spiral shaped bacteria, they look very strange. Stressful, yes. And um, if you look carefully, you're able to see, uh, just in case I've got an arrow over here, in case you're wondering. Uh, so look, follow the arrow, the cells here at the top, the bacteria at the top here do not move. Um, and the reason why they don't move here at the top is, is because I, I used very little um, water beneath uh, the cover glass. And for this reason, um, they were kind of compressed um, and are not able to move. Okay, so this is basically, um, I'll go back now to the to the topic here. So this is um, basically Anthony von Leeuwenhoek's discoveries and um, he not only uh, made this drawing, but I found another drawing um, in here. Where is it? Oh, here it is. Look at this here. Um, he put uh, also the blood of a salmon, that's, that's fish, um, under the microscope. And look what he saw here. And uh, yeah, these are different cells. These are eukaryotic cells. And do you see this little dot in here in, in the center? That is the nucleus um, of the cell. So um, what I'm going to do now is, is yeah, just uh, look at the, yeah, over here, just look at those the little oval, a little circle inside the cell. That's the nucleus. Of course, he himself did not know the significance of this. Uh, but I consider it already quite fascinating that, um, yeah, even the first uh, microscopist uh, around or one of the first microscopists around was, uh, were, was already able to identify the two different big different cell types um, in nature, the so-called prokaryotes, bacteria, which do not have a nucleus, okay, and uh, eukaryotic cells, which have a nucleus. And uh, of course, inside the nucleus, this is uh, where we have the DNA. And of course, uh, what I would like to do now is I would like to now sh not show you the blood of a salmon, but uh, I have the blood of a frog, which is very similar because uh, blood of frogs and fish, uh, amphibians and fish, uh, they have a nucleus, um, which is very different from to the blood of mammals. For example, our human red blood cells, they don't have a nucleus, uh, but those here, um, they do. And um, yeah, I'm going to, I hope I got the right slide in here now. So let's, uh, let's flip on the microscope here. Okay, and let's have a look what we are able to see here. And oh, that's the wrong slide uh, that I wanted to show you. Okay, unfortunately, ah, here, I have to change it. This here is actually uh, later on when I show you cell division, I would like to show this to you. But here I have to exchange the slide. You see that I'm very improvised today. And what we see over here is, is um, all of those dots that you see, these are the individual red blood cells um, of a frog. And uh, when you look into those uh, red blood cells, um, yeah, then you can see that there is this dark uh, dot in them and that is the nucleus and you, you can see the oval shape. So even Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, I don't know, in the 1600s, um, he was able to see uh, with this very simple microscope the basic, um, yeah, the basic shape uh, yeah, of those cells. Yeah? So back here um, again to the uh, to the drawing, but um, yeah, at that time he didn't know what cells are, um, and uh, he simply described his uh, findings. And only much later um, was it actually discovered um, what the different functions of the nucleus and so on is. Okay, so um, I'm going back again over here to um, yeah uh, to the comments. The book Microbe Hunters. Yes, I read the book and I highly recommend it. Okay, um, uh, from Paul Griff describes the first scientist of the microscopic world. This is a highly recommended book and very 
readable, yes. I read the book. Um, yeah, it's um, a little bit, uh, I have to tell you that uh, I didn't know of the title of the book uh, after I actually made the YouTube channel. I just uh, named it Micro Hunter, but then later on discovered that, uh, yeah, oh, around 100 years ago, um, yeah, Paul de Cruyff actually wrote a book called Micro Hunters. And I highly recommend this book. It is, uh, I think, still a bestseller. It was a best bestseller at that time. And it describes very well and in a very, very understandable um, way uh, the discoveries of uh, the early biologists uh, at that time, microbiologists at that time. And also, and that's why I like the book so much, the, the, the scientific reasoning and logic um, that uh, they actually used for his discoveries. Okay. So why are those bacteria so inactive that are clumped together? Yeah, um, they are simply, uh, uh, that's an interesting uh, um, uh, comment here as well. Those bacteria here um, are inactive because uh, um, they are simply compressed uh, between the cover glass uh, and uh, the microscope slide. Okay, they are simply inhibited in movement. Um, and that's it. If I were to add a little bit of more water, they would also start to move. Yeah. Um, and even those bacteria that move, um, strictly speaking, are not don't have complete freedom to move because they're not able to move vertically. Okay, because uh, there is the film, the layer of water is so thin, and that's why they are staying mostly in focus because they cannot move out of focus. So, um, if you want to observe bacteria under the microscope, really make sure that the amount of water that you use is is relatively low. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit, well, I don't have a cold, uh, but I do have, yeah, also luckily not Corona, but uh, because of talking and so on, I do feel that my voice is giving out a little bit sometimes, okay? How much uh, space is there between the slide and the cover glass anyway? Well, it depends on the amount of water that you use. But considering the fact that, um, let's say on average, a bacterial cell has maybe the diameter of one micrometer, which is a millionth of a meter, then I would probably say that maybe this is around the space that we've got here. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to say that you're my inspiration. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I've watched basically all of your videos and always wanted um, a microscope. I finally got one for Christmas and I've used it ever since. Okay, yeah. So, um, thank you very much. The uh, uh, frog blood cells are the methylene blue stain. I have to tell you honestly, uh, unfortunately, I don't know how they are stained. It does not say that. It is a commercially prepared slide. Um, but um, I assume that it is methylene blue and the reason is, is because methylene blue um, is able to stain DNA and of course DNA can be found in the nucleus um, of, of the cell. But what I would like to do is the following. I'd like to slowly move on a little bit here um, because um, yeah, but, uh, we start off uh, the cell theory with uh, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek um, and he made those beautiful drawings and uh, yeah, then actually we really start uh, with the next, uh, unfortunately there's no picture of him yeah, um, and his name is Robert Hook. And there are pictures in Wikipedia, but they also say that these are actually not him. Um, and they have been misattributed, so sorry. The only picture that I found is this one over here. Yeah, it's some kind of a memorial plaque um, um, yeah, in some cathedral. Maybe in the Westminster Cathedral in the, in London, I don't know, um, 1703. Uh, but um, his drawings are really, really nice. And this is one of uh, Robert Hooke's very famous drawing of cork. Um, and I, I think it almost looks photorealistic. And Robert Hooke, he was the person who came up with the name Cell. And now this is where it becomes a little bit interesting. And now, if you want to read his book where he uh, made those drawings and where he actually uh, wrote the text where he described his microscopic uh, discoveries, you can download it for free um, in Gutenberg. It's the text is, uh, yeah, this is just the photograph of the book cover. But the book, uh, Micrographia, it's called, it's in English. Yeah, I don't know why, yeah, it's, uh, the book is written in English. And uh, the book um, is also very readable and uh, it's, it's pretty large, <laughs> a lot to read. And what you can do is, is you can just simply open the HTML page. It's uh, the, the internet page. It's a long, long text. And you just search for the word cell. And then you're going to end up in the section where he describes cork. Okay, and um, uh, basically he was the one that uh, came up with the name cell. And uh, if you do a little bit of online research and you're going to read very often that he came up with the word cell because it kind of reminded him um, of the little rooms and cells of the monks in a monastery. 
But I have to be honest with you, I never found this reference inside the book. He rather, he always compared the cells, those little structures as pores to pores. And also he compared them, compared them to the, to the, to the hun honeycomb with, with bees, right? Um, those little structures. That's how the analogy that he used. But in, in, at least in the book Micrography, I was not able to find um, this reference that he named it cells because um, of, uh, yeah, they reminded him of the little rooms of, of, in a monastery. Yeah, so that is a, a little um, bit of an interesting thing. And I actually found a little quote and a reference um, in, so I want to uh, call yeah, um, in his uh, yeah, book Micrographia, which I copied here, and uh, here uh, that's one of the worst, uh, one of the first uses of, of of the word cells here. For as to the first, since our microscope informs us uh, that the substance of cork. That's why I've got the cork here. Yeah, yeah. the substance of cork is altogether filled with air. And that air is perfectly enclosed in little boxes or cells distinct from one another. Okay, so he already came up with the idea that those little boxes or cells, as he called them, are separate from each other. And I think that's already a very, very fundamental and important uh, realization. Okay, um, so he came up with the word cells and he realized that these are di uh, discrete entities. And uh, he described, um, you know, yeah, over several paragraphs, that uh, he, sent, he that he discovered that uh, uh, the because of the way that it looks like that this actually makes cork soft. Okay, so he realized that it is kind of filled with air, and therefore, um, yeah, um, cork is able to float. He also realized that, um, and uh, yeah, he basically um, came up uh, with the idea, uh, yeah, suggestion that not suggestion, but uh, then the, he came up with that. Yeah, with this drawing then to il illustrate that these are regular structures. Okay, I lost my my train of thought here a little bit. Okay, so do the blood cells again over to the to the uh, um, to the comments? Do the blood cells from frog and salmon have the similar organelles as human cells have? Oh, that's an interesting one. Okay, so a very important uh, a very important um, concept is this. Um, remember those two cell types here. That we've got here, uh, bacterial cells, and uh, these cells with a nucleus are so-called eukaryotic cells. And indeed, uh, plants, fungi, and animals to which we humans belong, we are eukaryotes. Our cells have a nucleus. However, and it's a big however, our red blood cells are an interesting example of cells that have lost their nucleus. So in that sense, the blood cells of amphibians, of frogs and humans and fish and humans are different uh, because even though we um, are similar in the sense that we're eukaryotes in general, the red blood cells um, are very specialized. Our red blood cells are very specialized in that they have lost their nucleus because the cells needed the space to carry hemoglobin, to carry oxygen. Yeah. So in other words, and that's also one of the things of the cell theory that I'm going to talk about, um, is, is that indeed cells, or pretty much all cells, are very similar um, on a microscopic level. Um, so if you take the cell of, I don't know, a plant, even cork, and compare it to a human cell, you might think, oh, they're so different. And of course, there are many differences. But the deeper you go in and the more fundamental you go, the deeper you go into the cell, um, the more similarities you're going to discover. And on a biochemical level, the similarity is even, even bigger. Yeah, so that is a very interesting um, yeah, realization, which also can, uh, forms a part of the cell theory. Okay. Every time I look at something like blood, rotifers, algae and stuff, I think of you giving interesting information about everything. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope it's interesting. So, um, yeah. So what I will do now is I will um, now look at a little bit of cork um, under the microscope. And I'm going to show you in case you want to also prepare some cork. Um, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of advice. Um, so I'm going to clear this away here. Yeah. So this was, uh, yeah. And we're just going to re replicate a little bit the very first uh, um, experiment. Uh, you take a little bit of cork and look what I've got here. Yeah, um, this is a yeah a, a, a for, for shaving, and it's very sharp. Now there are of course also those cutting board knives, okay, which you all know. Uh, they do not work as well because they are not quite sharp enough. Okay, they are also much thicker. I mean, of course they are very sharp, but not sharp enough. And those razor blades are really nice. And what you can try to do, and you don't need a special microtome. Um, and by the way, this uh, 
plastic handle. I also made myself with my 3D printer. Yeah, but you can also carefully try to hold the the razor blade uh, between uh, thumb and index finger. Just be careful that you don't cut yourself. Yeah, and then what you do is is you you try to very carefully slice off very very thin sections um, um, of the cork. Okay, and um, you want to stay very flat. Okay, and uh, what's going to happen is if you go down, if you go, no, okay, here we are. If you go down and if you go up again, and at the edges where you're going up again, you have, you can get a very, very thin cut. Okay, and what I have done is, is I have already yesterday um, prepared, uh, I've done this, um, yeah, I've made some very, yeah, very thin, yeah. Uh, very thin uh, cuts and make sure that uh, the blade is fresh, of course. And I prepared, um, yeah, um, some microscope slides here. Um, okay, I used uh, two different types of mounting media here. And I just want to show you now cork um, under the microscope. So uh, basically the drawing that you've just seen now, how does it compare now to, um, yeah, to what we're able to see these days um, under the microscope. So let's remove uh, the slide again. Okay. And let's have a look at the cork. Okay, let me do it like this again. So you see, I have to kind of find it. Ah, lots of air bubbles. Okay, a little bit out of focus as well. Yeah. And let's try to find a place, okay, where there is less air. Okay, all of those round circles that you see, these are air bubbles. But then, yeah, here you're able to see, yeah, these regular, yeah, shaped structures here. And this is also what uh, Robert Hooke was able to see. And um, of course, uh, our microscopes these days are so much better and therefore we're able to see many more details. Yeah, but um, yeah, you see those regularly shaped structures, yeah, which are the cell walls of, of cork. Yeah. And all of those round things that you see here, these are um, air bubbles. Huh? Yeah, so you can see that um, in that sense, we are also able to see that what uh, Robert Hooke already described, um, that essentially those spaces are filled with uh, quite a bit of air. Yeah? And you see over here, there's way too much air and therefore um, it's difficult um, yeah, to, to see the actual cell wall. Yeah? Yeah, let's go up a little bit with the magnification, why not? Okay, go up with the, the light intensity, refocus. Yeah. And you see that, um, um, yeah, I made those cuts uh, without any tool, without microtome, uh, just with my, uh, just, just, like, just like I showed you. And if uh, the knife is sharp enough, then you're able to get uh, sections that are really um, as thin as the cells are. Okay. So um, I just wanted to uh, tell you that the trick really is, is to use a very sharp uh, razor blade and a fresh one. Okay. Um, how does something move inside the cells? Uh, is it the organelles that are moving around or is it the cytoplasm moving the organelles around? Ah, that's a, also a good one. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you later on cytoplasmic streaming and the movement of cell organelles. And what happens is, is that there is a, something called a cytoskeleton. And the cytoskeleton, these are protein fibers. And along these protein fibers, vesicles and other cell organelles are pulled along. Because those vesicles, they carry substances uh, to make, for example, yeah, um, yeah, uh, cell walls and, and, and storage, uh, uh, grains uh, and so on. They carry substances along and those vesicles are being pulled along. Um, and uh, this causes the movement um, of the vesicles. And of course, when you're pulling things along, this causes also the, the streaming um, of the liquid inside the cell. But I've got um, some clips later on where I would like to talk about the movement specifically inside cells because um, it, it's very important also for the cell theory. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, wow, that's fascinating. Never thought of cork that way. Yep. Are you planning to do fluorescent microscopy at one point? Um, yes, 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 almost. Um, so this is an interesting question um, that I also would like to talk about. Is this, uh, I've got a microscope, I would like to exchange the light source to UV LED um, and then I can do some basic fluorescent microscopy. I've experimented around with this as, as well. Okay. Did Robert Hooke also use slides and cover glasses? Okay. Um, I think not. I think not. Um, the reason why I think uh, Robert Hooke uh, used epilumination is, is if you look at his drawings of his microscope, what he did is he actually used um, either the sunlight or a little flame and he passed it through a glass ball filled with water which acted like a lens so that the light is focused from the top. 
Okay, so I think that just from the drawings that um, I was able to see, um, it was actually epi um, illumination. So it's um, yeah, like we use these days in stereo microscopy, um, with the exception that uh, Robert Hooke only looked uh, through uh, with one eye. But uh, if you look at the drawing uh, of Robert Hooke's microscope, um, then you can actually see that there's an optical system next to the microscope, which is there to focus the light onto the specimen. Um, so if this is the case, then I'm almost quite sure that uh, cover glasses and uh, glass microscope slides were not used um, at that time. Okay. So yeah, hello from Tennessee. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let's, uh, I'll quickly move on a little bit um, because I want to, yeah, um, now we're with Robert Hooke. I want to uh, move on a little bit and I would like to now talk uh, about uh, three other gentlemen that were really imp uh, fundamental in, um, yeah, in the cell theory. But before I do that, I would like to talk about an interesting concept here. Uh, two interesting concepts. I gotta find the sheets here, and that is this concept called vitalism. Okay, vitalism and spontaneous generation. I have to talk about those uh, so that we understand how we even uh, came to the so-called cell theory, which I didn't. Yeah, we have got a separate piece of paper here. Um, people for many years kind of were wondering, um, well, what is it actually that makes living things alive? And how are living things uh, different from non-living things? And we've already seen in the chat here that some people are interested in movement. And movement is indeed one of the things that um, is important for living things. All living things have movement of some sort. Um, even, even plants move. If you just zoom in a lot and look into the cells, then you can see that there is movement inside the cells. Um, but you see, movement alone is not specific to life. I mean, there are many things in nature that move that are not considered alive. Clouds move, okay, for example, right? Um, a, a, a rocks that, a rock stones that fall down a mountain, they move. So movement is nothing, nothing unique uh, for life. So people were kind of wondering, what is it now that makes um, living things different from the non-living world? And they proposed um, the concept of vitalism, which basically states that um, the idea is, is that there is some kind of a force of life, a vital force, as they called it, um, in living things. So there seems to be some kind of a force of life. The problem with that is, is that um, the force of life um, is very vaguely defined. What is that? How can I measure it? What units do I use uh, to measure the force of life? So the problem is, is that this um, force of life cannot be measured because we don't really know what it is. We don't really know what to look for. And for this reason, uh, the concept of vitalism is really not accessible to scientific study. And therefore, yeah, it, it's not useful um, uh, for, for us, right? It may, maybe, maybe, maybe there is a force of life, but the problem is, 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 yeah, we don't know what to look for, right? And we cannot measure it. And uh, so for this reason, um, this concept of vitalism was uh, to describe living things was very unsatisfactory, insufficient, because we don't know how to measure it. Okay, um, we also don't know what it really is. So um, basically, for this uh, reason, this concept of vitalism was um, not really scientifically accessible. Okay, um, and therefore uh, people were looking for something else. And uh, one of the things that uh, then people kind of also proposed is, is well, um, is it possible for for living things to appear? where there was no life before. This, they call this spontaneous, spontaneous generation. This is the concept that, that living things can appear out of non-living material. Yeah, so for example, what people observe, this is, they, they've got some, I don't know, some, some, some vegetable and some, some soup. Yeah, they boiled it so it's all dead right, because of the heat, they've got some soup, and if you leave it stand now for a couple of um, days, it's going, bacteria are gonna all of a sudden grow in this soup. Right, um, so apparently the dead soup or the non-living soup was able to create or form life. Yeah. Nowadays, of course, we know that this was, it didn't form out of the soup, but actually this was contaminated from the outside. Right. Um, some bacteria fell in into the the nutrients into the soup, and then they started to divide and grow. That's what we know now. And Louis Pasteur, a very important French biologist, um, he was able to prove that spontaneous generation does not exist. Um, I just want to show you with those examples that um, the whole concept that living things are made of cells um, has a long history 
before that where people really didn't know really uh, what living material, what life is. Okay, what are living things made of? What characterizes living things, right? And uh, so this is kind of where we come from. And then um, there were a couple of uh, yeah, gentlemen that I talked about here. Okay, um, yeah, here I just want to show him. Um, Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann. Um, Mat Matthias Jakob Schleiden, he basically, he said that all plants are made of cells. Yeah? And then Schwann, he sa uh, said that all animals are made of cells. Um, and uh, this was in, in 1838 and 1839. Um, but um, yeah, sure, that's what they're made of. But where do they come from? And um, yeah, is it uh, that they're able to form spontaneously? Well, and I will not, now I want to tell you a little bit of what people actually thought. And also Schleiden, he himself, even though he, he proposed that all plants are made of cells, he thought that cells are actually able to form just like crystals are able to form. I just want to show this to you here. Very beautiful. This is uh, um, under polarized light uh, in time lapse, which I made some time ago. These are crystals forming and you see how they're moving and how they're growing. Um, and there where there were no crystals before, all of a sudden we have crystals, right? So may maybe that's the same as with cells. Okay, maybe cells are also able, um, able to form on their own. You know what I'm going to do now? Because it's such a beautiful image, I'm just going to make myself disappear now. Okay, I'm still here, don't worry. But now you get a nice, beautiful, full uh, screen view. Yeah, so that is caffeine. So I, I dissolved some caffeine and allowed the water to evaporate. And then under polarized light, you see these beautiful crystals forming. And people at that time thought, well, wow, maybe, maybe cells are also able to form in a similar way. Nowadays, of course, of course, we know that cells form by cell division. Yeah, but at that time, um, this was not so sure. Okay. Yeah. So, so here I'm, I'm back again. Okay. Um, so, um, so what I um, want to now basically say is the following. Look, um, the cell theory states the following, and uh, here we go back to the. Um, yeah, to, to, to this here, and um, there are three parts to the original cell theory. All living things are made of cells. All of them. All, all, currently living in the past and in the future, it's made of cells. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. How can, how, how can we know that, that all of them are made of cells? Cells are the basic unit of life. So this means you need to have at least one cell for it to be considered alive. So all of the things that you see moving inside a cell, per definition, are not alive, even though they move. It's the whole cell that you need. And cells can only come from pre-existing cells. Now, this, of course, is a chicken and egg problem, right? If cells can only come from pre-existing cells, where did the first cells come from? Okay, so, um, yeah, what I'm going to do now is, is um, I'm going to now show you a little bit some uh, more slides and the problems that, um, that um, you have with the cells here. I mean, just uh, discovering that. And um, we already looked at, uh, yeah, the, um, at the cork here. I just want to show you now um, another plant. It's a sunflower. Okay, so let's have a look at the sunflower. Um, under the microscope. So that's again a commercial slide. Um, and uh, I, I love those uh, because they are really look beautiful. Okay, look at this here. Okay, you see again those regular structures. Yeah, and uh, cells of different sizes. And by the way, that what is uh, stained blue. Now that's of course, these are the cell walls, right? So the individual in the plant, the individual cells can, can be seen quite easily. Okay. So that is not that's not so much of an issue. So I think it's it's uh, yeah. You you take a whole bunch of plants, you make them thin, you put them under the microscope, you see cells, always those regular structures. So I think um, it's fairly easy fairly easy to come up with the idea all plants are made of cells. But I want to show you now the following here. Um, the, um, where is the? Um, do I have the other one over here? Um, let me see. Division. Well, here it is, rotifer. Yeah, that is a rotifer, a, a microscopic animal, also, of course, made of cells. But can you please tell me where are the cells here? Here it's not so easy to see, yeah, uh, because uh, animals don't have a cell wall um, and the cell membrane that separates the cells is so thin that you cannot see it very well under the microscope. Yeah, but over here, where, where over here does one cell stop and the next one start? And the uh, rotifers, they have around a thousand cells. Yeah? Um, so it's actually one of the smaller animals that we have here. Um, and uh, yeah, they're, they're alive, sure. Um, are they made of cells? Well, I, cannot, I can't see it. 
Okay. Okay. Now we start again here. Okay. Um, so, so where are the cells here? So, um, as a matter of fact, it kind of shows a little bit that, um, um, actually coming up with the idea that all, also all animals are made of cells is already a pretty, uh, an interesting, it's already a pretty an interesting, uh, uh, thing. Yeah. So, uh, let's move uh, back again. Just a second. I will just, uh, yeah, uh, let's back again to some of the questions here. Um, what makes the main decision when moving things like small cells, like proteins, like what is the main brain or coordination in things like moving molecules? Well, honestly, uh, <laughs> that's, an, that's a good one as well. Um, ultimately, everything can be reduced to chemical reactions. So even when vesicles move along inside a cell, which I'm going to show you um, in a second, even that is um, essentially, it can be reduced down to a chemical reaction. Um, so we try, uh, molecular biologists try to understand those things in terms of chemical reactions. Or for example, um, I'm going to later show you also uh, some muscle under the microscope, a movement which is macroscopically visible, right? When I'm, I'm moving, I'm talking, uh, yeah? um, on a very chemical level, it is actually protein fibers sliding past each other, make contracting the muscle. And this sliding action is, can be explained by chemical interactions. So ultimately, even those large movements that we see the macroscopically on a very basic level are chemical processes. Yeah? I just downloaded the book of micrography in HTML format and I had a quick glance. It is very well organized. Thanks for sharing. Yes, uh, yes, please. Um, it is. Uh, you can download it from Gutenberg. Um, I have not seen a PDF version yet, but I like the HTML version because you can quickly uh, search uh, for words. Yeah. And if you type in cell, it's an, um, yeah, the word cell is also used in a different context somewhere else, but he uses it a lot um, when talking about uh, the cork. Yeah. Basically, how do they make decisions to move? Um, <laughs> yes, um, I don't know if you can call it a decision. Um, they have a nervous system. That, that's for sure, uh, a very simple nervous system. And uh, however, um, even those, even cells that do not have a nervous system, like a single cell uh, organisms, even they are able to sp respond to their environment. And even bacteria are able to respond to the environment without a nervous system. So what they have is, is um, single celled um, organisms, when they, for example, move towards oxygen, what they have is, is they're able to detect an oxygen gradient. Uh, yeah, because there's a, some kind of a diffusion gradient and this way they're able to see that one part of the cell is has a higher oxygen concentration than the other part of the cell and this tells them into which direction to swim. Okay, Diffusion or motor proteins that walk on the microtubules. Yes, these are the motor proteins mm -hmm. uh, with signals that are encoded in the primary protein sequence. Are there organisms with quote only two or three cells? Uh, we have single-celled organisms and multicellular organisms, but are there examples of so-called two- or three-celled organisms? Um, um, let's put it this way. Um, when a cell divides, um, let's say a bacterium, okay, it, and it divides, then sometimes uh, the two cells will stick together, okay? Um, and um, however, if you physically separate them, then they're still able to survive. Um, generally, what you have is, is that at this level, because you do not have so-called cell differentiation, because the cells are the same, you do not refer to them uh, as a multicellular organism. So my suggestion is, is that if you see a clump of cells sticking together, okay, be it bacteria or, or whatever, um, and when you ask yourself, is it now basically, are these just separate cells sticking together or can you already talk about a, a certain multicellular organism, then ask yourself if the cells are all the same or not. Even if they're genetically the same, okay, they can be genetically the same, but sometimes they have different functions and different shape. Um, and this is called cell differentiation. If cell differentiation has happened, um, then uh, you can talk about it, um, you can refer to it as a multicellular organism. And um, in my view, um, if you only have, let's say, two or three cells together, I think there is not really enough basis for proper cell differentiation. But then again, I just want to pass along with your general recommendation that I have. Uh, um, because when we were students, when I was a student, we also asked a lot of questions at the university and one of the interesting answers, uh, which I also pass on to my students and which I also would like to share with you is, is if you can imagine it, 
then probably somewhere in nature, if you look hard enough, you're going to find it. Unless it violates some basic laws of biology or physics, um, then you're probably able to find it somewhere. Okay, just look hard enough. Maybe we've, we've not found it yet. Okay, so if you're asking, if you're asking, um, yeah, is it possible um, uh, to have uh, um, basically uh, two or uh, three celled organisms that show a form of cell differentiation, then um, maybe I don't know of one right now, but if you look hard enough, probably somewhere you're going to find it. Okay, um, the very basic form of cell differentiation you can already f uh, find in in cyanobacteria, where there are so-called um, there are film, um, basically cells, um, yeah, photosynthetic cells in a yeah in a string, and some of, some of them are so-called heterocysts, and this, these uh, specialized cells that are there for nitrogen fixation, and this can already be seen as a very basic form of of, of cell differentiation. Yeah? Um, so. Uh, Okay, 60 plus, only 30% plus likes, okay. Uh, the story with the soup started with uh, Spelanzani, I believe. Yeah, um, in, you, um, in the book Microbe Hunters, which we already talked about, please, um, it's so interesting, I really recommend it, okay? So let's move back a little bit uh, to, um, uh, to, the, uh, to the cell theory, okay? Here we are again, okay? All living things are made of cells. Here, I need to talk about the following. Um, how can I be so arrogant or how can we scientists be so arrogant to claim that from the few, comparatively few living things that we put under the microscope, I mean, we looked at a lot of them, okay, but compared to that, what is out there in nature, it's really small what we actually observed. How can I be so arrogant to be able to say that all living things are made of cells? That's an interesting question. Well, I have to tell you, um, that is what a scientific theory is all about. Okay, a scientific theory is a generalized. We generally it's called the uh, induction. You go from specific examples to a general law. Where, for example, in physics, you're also saying, um, yeah, the laws of physics are the same in the whole universe. Well, I've not not been at, in the whole universe before, so how can I say that, right? This is uh, called induction, and this is when you go from specific examples to a general law, and um, there is one way of actually testing whether this is a good theory or not, and that is by trying to actually destroy the theory. All you have to do is, is you have to find me one living thing which is not made of cells. And uh, if you are able to do that, you have destroyed the cell theory. Um, this is uh, the so-called the falsifiability criterion. Um, basically, a theory remains correct or true until it is proven wrong. And so far, nobody was able to disprove the cell theory. You can go out and grab yourself a microscope and try to prove it wrong, okay? Try to find me an organism that is not made of a cell, yeah? um, a living thing. And uh, then you've uh, actually uh, disproven the cell theory. So, cells are the basic unit of life. I need to explain this here a little bit. And I'm going to now show you now um, an onion cell over here in time lapse. And uh, here, what you're able to see now is I'm going to, yeah, you can hear this is the, nu where's the arrow? Here it is. That's the nucleus. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, here, um, that's again a different, yeah. This large area that you see in here, that's uh, the vacuole. And you see those tiny little dots here in the cytoplasm moving around. So that's the vacuole here, it's a storage. For storage of water and you see that here on the side here this is where the cytoplasm is uh, the living contents of the cell and here uh, this line here that you see that's the cell wall and you see that there are these little dots moving these are vesicles okay they have a membrane around them and they're pulled along um, microtubules um, and they're transporting substances and um, the thing is even though they're moving they themselves are not considered to be alive Okay, it's you need only the whole cell is considered to be alive. And this is what the second part of the cell theory actually means is that the cell is the basic unit of life. You need to have at least one cell for an yeah, for life to exist. Yeah? And any subcellular structures, even if they move and even if they do all sorts of interesting things, um, any of these subcellular structures on their own per definition are not considered alive. Okay, so this is a, yeah, and I'm going to now show you another one. I, yeah, I, I like this one here as well. <laughs> this here um, is now Elodia, which is a water plant, also in time lapse. And all I've done is I've taken this uh, one leaf uh, without preparation, really, and put it directly under the microscope. And uh, I yeah, video made a video for quite a, some time, and I was speeding it up. 
And uh, you can see now the movement of those chloroplasts. They're doing photosynthesis and they're being pulled along uh, by the moving cytoplasm. And uh, yeah, they're moving. Are they alive? Well, per definition, not, uh, because uh, you need to have at least one cell. Now, I know that some of you who know a little bit more about biology are thinking of the so-called endosymbiontic theory, which uh, states uh, that mitochondria and chloroplasts once were separate cells that moved into a host cell. Um, so actually, if this is the case, uh, then we actually have to say that, um, yeah, they probably once were alive, uh, those green chloroplasts, because these were separate entities back in, in, in time, long time ago. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, move again on here while um, you can watch those beautiful little uh, chloroplasts floating around. Um, is um, are, are there species today that can be traced back to cells that would have been related to mitochondria? Um, yeah, all of us, all of, the, the thing is, is that all living things, all living things on earth today, all living things on earth today um, can be traced back to one original cell and the mitochondria and also those chloroplasts, and that's what it's the so-called the endosymbiontic theory that I just talked about, once were separate cells that moved into a host cell. Okay, and this is how those eukaryotic cells uh, emerged. There is very strong uh, genetic evidence uh, for this because uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts actually also have their own DNA. So they have done even DNA studies of this. But ultimately, um, all living things can be traced back uh, to um, one first cell. And now how this first cell emerged, well, we cannot turn back time. There are a couple of um, yeah, also speculations or theories um, yeah, or ideas of how this could have happened. Yeah. Did the first cells originate from spontaneous generation? Well, um, strictly speaking, the word spontaneous generation um, is used, to my knowledge, primarily in the context that living things are able to appear right now out of non-living material. But strictly speaking, if you uh, maybe use um, the word spontaneous generation, the term a little bit wider, strictly speaking, it has you probably have to say, yeah, the first cell must have appeared by spontaneous generation. And uh, the, the models that there are right now is the following. And there is also some evidence for this because uh, these concepts can be observed even nowadays in, in the lab. Is it um, at the beginning there were so-called uh, catalytic RNA molecules? That's what they think uh, was present. And this, these are basically molecules which were, yeah, chemicals which were able to copy themselves. Okay, and, and and so this is kind of the idea that the first uh, form of reproduction were chemicals that were able to copy themselves, which then formed a, a cell membrane around them. Yeah? And you are able to make basic cells, even in lab today, all you do they take is you take um, a whole bottle of phospholipids with some water and you shake it, <laughs> um, and then you are able to form uh, those, um, those structures, uh, yeah, very basic cells, um, not, not cells, actually empty, um, empty uh, membrane bubbles um, and if you now have in them some kind of replicating uh, molecules then you could say maybe that's already the very first basic form of a cell. Scientists are trying to work on this of, of making that right um, but uh, these are kind of the ideas of how first cells could have appeared but then again we cannot turn time back okay um, so we don't know how it really happened. Yeah? Um, so there is still, I think to a certain extent it's speculative, but there are, there are some ideas there which are not completely unplausible because um, scientists are trying to recreate uh, certain things even these days. What do you think of uh, reverse aging that seems to be accomplished by mice lately and maybe accomplished in humans soon according to some news reports? Reverse aging, I think uh, this has to do a little bit with the extension of the telomeres of the chromosomes. Yeah, um, I don't know a lot about this, um, but um, I know that... Uh, uh, I, I'll give you a different answer. Um, and this kind of sounds a little bit weird. Um, but people, uh, scientists have been kind of wondering is why is it like this that uh, many organisms have a limited lifespan? Like we humans obviously have a limited, and many other organisms as well. And the reason is, is you have to have a, um, um, a regeneration of the species because otherwise the species is not able to adapt to a changing environment. Yeah? So it is important that the older 
unfortunately, uh, the parent generation, and I'm not talk, only talking about humans, but of, of any living thing, um, will basically produce children, offspring, which are genetically different than the parent generation. And for this reason, every new generation is able to adapt itself to a new environment. Yeah? So it is, uh, ensures that in a changing environment, the species is able to survive. Yeah? So, okay. I believe Louis Pasteur has disproved uh, this finally. In the, yes, spontaneous generation was disproven by Louis Pasteur. That's correct. That's why you even nowadays talk about pasteurization. And I would like to show you something else here. Okay, look, um, because um, what we have here is is um, yeah. Look what I have got here. Okay, here it is. Uh, it's, um, it's it's a tin can, tuna, tuna fish. Um, yeah, so it's uh, simply in a, in a tin can. And I looked at the date, uh, 2024. So in a year or two years time. Um, yeah, in a year, almost two years time, July 2024, um, it's going to expire. So this basically means that uh, I can store this unrefrigerated for a very long time. And the question is, why is that? And why is it when I open it that um, I have to eat it very quickly? Otherwise, it's going to spoil. And the reason is, is that's uh, what Louis Pasteur also discovered. If you have, if you, if the contents is free of bacteria, free of life, because this tuna fish uh, has been boiled, everything's dead, bacteria or life is not able to form spontaneously. Yeah? And if you open it, it's not the air that's the problem, but it's the bacteria and fungi, fungi and, and, and falling into the food, which then starts to grow and this spoils the food. Right? Uh, so you see that the cell theory that um, cells can only come from pre-existing cells, from pre-existing living cells, this last part of the cell theory here is extremely important because this allows us, this understanding allows us to, to, uh, yeah, to also make yeah, food like this, which is packaged and which can be stored for a very long time because it's not going to spoil on its own. Um, I know that there are some cases when it's not properly cooked and when there are some bacteria in there, um, they're able to also cause food poisoning. There are some, um, you know, some, some cases of this as well. But this is when there is a problem in the manufacturing process. This was back in the day. Uh, was a problem, especially when people made their own tin canned food. Um, and uh, yeah, I, rem yeah, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 years ago, um, there were some uh, some some issues. But um, yeah, but this basically means that uh, they kind of enclosed bacteria in um, in the tin can. Yeah? Uh, but uh, yeah, it's not going to spoil on its own, even past the expiry date. Um, uh, it's not going to spoil because uh, you need living cells in order um, for new cells uh, to appear. Okay. Um, but without spontaneous generation, life could not have started. Yes. Uh, so basically, it's it's um, yeah, the, the first cell must have come from non-living material. Sure. Yeah. Um, cells derived from non-living substance over time. Specific chemical reactions uh, were favored under these circumstances, which led to protocells. Yes. Okay, algae-like uh, stenedesmos uh, like to stick together in quadruples. Yes, this is correct, and that's nothing unusual that certain cells stick together. Uh, but this is not the question: is, is if you can really refer to them as being truly multicellular, because there is no cell differentiation happening. Yeah, so uh, essentially having colonies of cells this is nothing unusual. Yeah, but um, in many cases these colonies are. Yeah, actually, there are some volvox. It does. Yeah, if the colonies are larger, then you already have a form of of um, of, of differentiation going on. The question is: is is this now truly multicellular or not? Or not? It's I think a little bit of a definition question. Yeah. So sticking together accidentally could be the origin of multicellular organisms. If their offspring is prone to sticking together, they will likely do that too. Well, I wouldn't say accidentally or sticking. Well, I mean, you have a, a what you have is, is you have one cell and you have this cell dividing and they stay together, right? So it's not that they were separate and coming together, but they kind of stay together. And then you have essentially um, the cells developing differently because different parts of their DNA are expressed. So they start to become, I don't know, one part starts to form one organ, the other part starts to form another organ, even though their DNA is the same. This is uh, basically referred to as, as uh, cell differentiation. Huh? Well, there are a lot of questions here. Okay, so let me go. Yeah. How do I distinguish Brownian motion from bacteria? That's also very good. Okay, um, very briefly, um, what you, I mean, it's kind of clear. Um, what you have is, is that in many bacteria, what they will do is, is they will have a much more directional movement. Okay, Brownian motion is kind of the random motion of, and they're kind of particles bouncing around. And sometimes bacteria will also be subjected to Brownian motion. 
So the, the bacteria also kind of move around and bounce around, but they don't move on their own. And um, actual real movement is, is, uh, can be much more directional. Okay? Even if it is random, uh, the movement um, is um, yeah, often larger than just the bouncing around um, of Brownian motion. Okay? So you know what I'm going to do now is, is um, I'm, um, yeah, I'm going to expand this now. Let's go back a little bit to the cell theory. Um, I'm just checking the time. So modern version of the cell theory. I mean, the, the cell theory has been um, expanded as well. Um, energy flow happens um, in cells. The, the whole DNA topic um, has been added. Uh, biochemistry, all cells have basically the same chemical composition. It's kind of interesting as well. That chemically, um, we are you know, on the fundamental level, all cells are the same. We have got carbohydrates, we've got proteins, we've got nucleic acids and lipids. So these are the four big categories of, of, of macromolecules and which all living things have. Um, and uh, so you see that um, even if the organism is, is, uh, looks quite very different from the outside on a very chemical level, um, there is a big similarity here, right? And uh, that's basically what is um, yeah, some, some additions that have been made. So um, yeah, all living things, cells can only come from pre-existing cells. Um, this guy here was responsible for that, yeah? Rudolf Virchow. Um, he basically said that um, cells can only come from pre-existing cells. Um, and um, he was actually um, building on this, you know, the, the basic idea of Schleiden and Schwann because Schleiden, he himself says, well, cells appear like crystals, right? And then Virchow says, no, that's not correct. Um, you need to have a cell which is dividing. And uh, I just wanted to show you as well here. Um, yeah, I think I'm also going to make myself disappear now. Yeah, this is a paramecium. So... So I made myself disappear so that you can see this better. It's a paramecium which is dividing, not in time lapse. It is in real speed. And um, yeah, you know what? I'm going to pause the video now because I want to show you something. Here, where is the arrow? Here is the arrow. Um, look at all of those dots that are floating around. Many of them are bacteria, as a matter of fact, right? Um, and they are cells. And the paramecium here, which is dividing, um, essentially um, is a eukaryote. It has a nucleus. As a matter of fact, it has several nuclei. Um, the macronucleus and micronuclei and, and so on. With DNA, it's significantly larger. So we humans, for example, being, being animals, um, have a cell structure which is very similar um, uh, to those uh, paramecia here. And the bacteria in the background that you see moving around, they are moving because the tiny here, the cilia um, of the paramecium, they moves, it moves the water, but some of those uh, might also move on their own. Right, so let's go on here, and that is, yeah. See, some of them actually, um, yeah, are moving because of the water movement, yeah, and uh, yeah. Here it's after a couple of minutes later, yeah, it started. They're still holding together, and uh, still after a couple of minutes later, they completely separated. So for me, I, I can at this level, I can always consider this a little bit fascinating. This is now the question is really what is now an individual here. Um, there is no parent. Let me, okay, I go away again. There is no parent and there is no offspring because both of these cells are not only genetically the same, yeah, but they also have the same size in this case. Yeah? They're still almost connected over here, over the cilia, the little here. Yep, and now they kind of, yeah, they're, now they're separating. Yeah? No, not yet. Yeah, um, yeah now you see kind of, they're kind of pulling. Uh, yeah. Yes, here, here we go now, okay? Now they're completely separate, right? Uh, I found another uh, ciliate over here, which was dividing. Yeah? And I remember in the book Microbe Hunters by Paul de Cruyff, with the book that I recommended, it was very interesting because when um, um, it, it was observed first that uh, they divide, um, there were critics that says, no, 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 they don't divide. Um, they, they basically, they separate into two because uh, they bump against an object and this causes them to break apart. Can you believe this? And this is really, really, um, really uh, a fascinating idea where basically uh, people observed the cell division under the microscope and then there were critics there and says, well, actually, they're not really dividing. Um, you've got uh, two pieces because they broke apart because uh, they bumped against an object and that kind of made them separate. Yeah. And so, and then, uh, yeah, the, the the researcher who was it Spelanzani? I don't know. Um, uh, basically, then made it made a setup where it was not possible for them to bump into other cells. 
fault, right? And he was able to disprove, uh, he debunk all of those uh, those critics. Yeah? But uh, in any case, um, this is um, yeah um, quite a uh, quite a, a nice uh, thing. And um, if you want to actually see those uh, cells um, also divide, then what I've done is, is I've added a little bit of food in, into a water sample, and uh, this kind of promoted the growth here. Okay. So I'm um, going back to the comments here. It seems like they are capable of mass producing any kind of cells. Therefore, the use of these cells could probably be used to rejuvenating creatures. Well, I don't know exactly now to which uh, idea this refers to because there were so many ideas already discussed here. Okay. Uh, oh, I don't want to participate in any reverse aging trials. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So if I uh, stick a sterile fork just once in a tuna can and then I close it again, is it still good for a long time? Ah, that's an interesting one. <coughs> so the, uh, the question is the following. Um, if you um, put a something sterile, where is this here? If you put something sterile, I don't know, let's see. Let's say I, I heat up, I heat up the, the whatever um, on the gas flame, I steer, I'm, I puncture it, okay, and then I immediately close it again. Is it going to then be able to be sterile? And the answer is, is if you are really, if you can really make sure that no bacteria or fungi have entered it, then yes, it's going to stay sterile and it's going to be fine. Um, but it's almost impossible um, or very difficult. Um, so what you have to do if you want to really try this experiment, you have to make sure that you disinfect everything over here uh, with alcohol. You make sure that you whatever you use to puncture it, you disinfect, usually over a gas flame. You make sure that the table is completely wiped off uh, clean so that there is no dust. You have to make sure that there is a very little dust in the air. You're working next to the gas flame. And all of these techniques indeed are used in a microbiology lab. How do you work in, in a sterile way so that your agar plates where you grow your bacteria do not become contaminated? Okay, so uh, the answer is, is uh, if yeah you stick a sterile fork just once in a tuna can, and then close it again. Is it good for a long time? And the answer is, is if you can really make sure that no bacteria were able to enter, then yes. Okay. Maybe certain people or groups have had the capability long time to rejuvenate. Yeah. So we've got the discussion about rejuvenation here. Why don't red blood cells don't have a nucleus? Well, human red blood, well, of mammals, the red blood cells of mammals are very typical that they do not have a nucleus because the, for two reasons, the space is needed to pack it with hemoglobin to carry oxygen. And the lack of a nucleus is um, also important because it makes the cell more flexible. And it's, uh, the red blood cell therefore is able to squeeze better through the na narrow blood capillaries. Okay. Um, is it safe to eat the food inside the can past expiration date if microorganisms can't get inside or are there chemical reactions happening inside that can make the food poisonous? Um, generally, is it safe? Um, the thing is the following, um, no organic substance, including food, which is organic obviously, um, is stable enough over long term. The reason is organic substances will break apart over time because of, believe it or not, temperature and cosmic radiation. Okay, so yes, there is always cosmic radiation falling on Earth, uh, and what they will do is this radiation will strike the organic substances and will cause it to fall apart. How long does this have take? Honestly, probably, I don't know, maybe thousands of years, I don't know. Is it generally safe to eat past the expiration date? If there are no bacteria in there, um, no poisons could have formed. Um, uh, generally what I found or what many people find is if it's long past the expiration date, um, the food will not taste as good. It will taste stale because um, some of the substances that are actually responsible for the flavor will have broken down. Not because they were broken down by bacteria, but because organic substances generally are more unstable. Yeah. So um, yeah. So for this reason, I've seen that sometimes uh, I've eaten food which has been long past expiration date um, and uh, yeah. It simply doesn't taste good anymore. Yeah. You could use a Bunsen burner to generate the airflow. Yes, that's what I've been doing in the microbiology lab. Yeah. Um, because of the function of the red blood cells to bind oxygen, they have lost the nucleus to basically bind as much oxygen through the hemoglobin. Yes, exactly. Um, they seem to be discussing reverse aging beyond the chromosome level. Uh huh. They say internal DNA programming of the DNA in mice and making them reverse aging. That's interesting. Well, uh, those aging experiments have been done already also on, on certain nematode worms. 
Um, and uh, so there is research going on. But I have to tell you, I don't know very much about it. Okay. Um, what causes a cell to have a genetic mutation and leads to cancer? Okay, I can tell you that uh, mutations happen statistically. Uh, no reason, because uh, yeah, chemical reactions simply happen and uh, there is a repair mechanism inside the cells which uh, basically uh, repairs a cell uh, DNA damage. However, in the case of radiation, as I already talked about, uh, radiation particles strikes DNA um, and causes uh, basically yeah, DNA damage. Um, certain chemicals, what they will do is they will react with the DNA. These are called cancer-causing chemicals. And um, it depends now where this DNA damage happens. Um, and if this DNA damage happens in regions which uh, control cell division, then, of course, uh, you have a problem that you might get a tumor. But then again, uh, you the human body has, cell, has a DNA repair mechanism. Okay? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, each uh, division of the genetic material has to be copied. Yes, exactly. So sometimes what happens is the following. When you have, for example, ultraviolet radiation striking DNA, then you can form so-called uh, thymine dimers. So basically two bases uh, are locked together and this can cause uh, mistakes in copying the DNA. Okay. And uh, this, uh, um, yeah. Can you distinguish bacteria from archaea? Um, well, not so much under the microscope, uh, but uh, chemically and genetically you can. Okay, so bacteria, eubacteria and archaea, they have uh, different, uh, for example, uh, yeah, phospholipids in, in um, types of phospholipids and other things. Yeah? Uh, using a microscope, not that, uh, both are prokaryotes. So I probably wouldn't say, maybe there are certain staining techniques that could be used, not that I know of, but under the microscope, no. Yeah? And also the, the, the morphological diversity of bacteria is very large, so the shape of diversity is very large. Yeah? The, uh, the issue of a fountain of youth has been a central issue of mankind, okay? Um, yeah. For example, uh, cervical cancer is caused by the virus, which uh, forces the cells to divide. Yeah, um, there are certain viruses that can also, for example, um, the Epstein-Barr virus, which can cause blisters here. Yeah. Um, there are certain viruses that can actually um, um, yeah, uh, trigger cancer. Also, for example, HIV virus can do that because it integrates into the DNA and every um, virus that kind of messes up the DNA is somehow able to uh, you know, also promote cancer. Um, how do red blood cells reproduce without a nucleus and DNA? Well, that's a good question. Um, I did make in this uh, channel a video on this, is, is they don't reproduce. Okay. Once you've got a red blood cell, it doesn't divide anymore. But during the formation of the red blood cell, the cell out of which the red blood cell is formed, it will divide and it's an asymmetric division so that the, the nucleus is, is found in a tiny cell which is not used and which is broken down. And the rest that remains, um, it will become the red blood cell. Yeah? So it's some, some an asymmetric division in which the, um, yeah, the nucleus is expelled. But once you've got a red blood cell, it itself does not divide. It cannot divide anymore correctly, as you say, because it doesn't have a nucleus. Yeah? How are red blood cells pre re uh, reproduced without a nucleus? Well, because the original cell, um, out of which you want, the hematopoietic cell out of which you want to make a red blood cell has a nucleus. Okay, and then this divides and uh, it expels the nucleus and then you've got the leftover without the nucleus. Okay. Um, does evolution operate at the cellular level or only at the level of the organism um, on both levels? Okay. Um, basically, uh, you can even say the following. I mean, honestly, we were just talking about cancer and so on. Um, it's like this, that those cells that form tumors. I know it's not a cool example, but I mean, yeah, they have a higher, they reproduce and therefore they have a selective advantage. Yeah, and that's why they're the ones who are successful in rep reproducing and that's why they have a tumor, right? Um, so generally what, um, uh, I would like to answer the question a little bit differently. Evolution operates uh, um, on the, ex not on the DNA level itself, uh, but on the proteins that are made. And the question is, 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 are the proteins that are made and the structures that are made from the, those proteins, do they give the cell um, an advantage to survive? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I quickly skim down here. Today's incredible technology seems to be able to control anything these days, including aging. Yep, we're back at the aging question. Okay. Uh, who is, in your opinion, the greatest microbiologist ever? Uh, look, that's a difficult one. Um, 
I mean, let's put it this way: scientific research. I'll also not. I, I'm not. Yeah, well, I'm gonna. Well, there were a couple of uh, uh, biologists that uh, Robert Koch. Uh, for example, was very important. Louis Pasteur was very important. These were all um, uh, microbiologists at the time of the so-called the golden age of microbiology, which basically means at this time there was lots of uh, there were lots of discoveries. However, there were many people who spent and dedicated their whole life um, to um, to research. Yeah, and because um, they have also um, sometimes did experiments on themselves because they just wanted to find out what is the cause of this disease. Right. Um, so uh, at the beginning. Uh, especially many of those uh, researchers or, um, were, you know, had a medical background because they wanted to solve the problem you know, of, of, of certain diseases. So um, I would say, <laughs> I know this is not a, a, a um, yeah, I would say anyone who dedicated his or her life <laughs> um, to research and to make uh, the world a better place uh, yeah, is, uh, yeah, it deserves to be great. Uh, and those people who use their knowledge to design, okay, um, yeah, maybe biological weapons or things like this. I don't like that so much. Okay, okay. Um, so different light waves are able to change a cell. Yes, uh, ultraviolet light uh, is, is uh, radiation, uh, which uh, is high energy and which is able to randomly change DNA. Uh, and uh, but the consequences you don't know. So sometimes the cell dies and sometimes the cell will start to form a tumor. Okay. Yeah, Leeuwenhoek. Okay, yeah, <laughs> one of the very early ones. I always have doubt on current paradigm for studying gene expression of cells. Unwind 2D structures are used while our chromosomes are 3D. Any thoughts? Okay, I think this is an interesting one. Um, it goes a little bit off. Uh, the question is, is when we're doing uh, DNA studies in molecular biology, and I, I see the same problem a little bit. You see, I'm also a school teacher teaching biology. I make drawings on a chalkboard, um, simplified drawings on a chalkboard. Um, and I make a drawing and that's how a chromosome looks like. This is how DNA looks like or even a cell, yeah? a chalkboard drawing of a cell. Um, and I'm not able to show the three-dimensional nature and I'm not able to show the movement okay, um, and, and the activities that actually happen. So um, I, I get the point, but the problem is, is especially in education, sometimes we have to simplify and we have to make simplified models in order to um, actually communicate that what we want to communicate. Yeah. So it's a little bit of a yeah um, 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 of an issue here. So uh, wow, I've been talking, 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 and I want to show you this here. It's a green algae, Acetabularia. It's called. How big? About this size. Okay. Um, apparently, it lives in the Mediterranean. There are different species, and this thing is one of those what they call special cases of the cell theory. Because this thing here has only, you won't believe it, one nucleus. When I read this the first time, I couldn't believe it myself. There is um, a, um, some root-like structures on the bottom, and there is one nucleus there. So st strictly speaking, this whole thing is one cell. Okay, um, it has been extensively studied, um, and um, yeah, um, so this is one of those examples where you have a, a macroscopic organism, yeah which is not made of multiple cells like you normally would think of. Yeah, so this is uh, one of those, um, yeah, uh, some books call it exceptions to the cell theory. I don't like the word exceptions really. I think some kind of special cases, it's still on a cellular basis. It's got DNA, it's got a nucleus, but only one nucleus. So the question is, are you able to see cells uh, without a microscope? Well, here, here is one, right, this size. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, been extensively researched um, as well. Um, there have been transplantation studies have been done where they've uh, cut out part of the um, stem and transplanted it on a different uh, species and then they discovered um, it doesn't matter, it will form the, the cap um, determined by the nucleus which can be found in the root part, in the foot part um, of the algae. Yeah. So this is an interesting one. And I also would like to show you another interesting exception to the cell theory or a special case. And that is this slide over here. It says the tongue of a rabbit. So I'm going to show you some muscles now, okay? Um, because those muscles um, are also a little bit unique. So that's again our the sunflower plant. Yeah, And those uh, muscles um, are... Yeah, that's what we've got in, in our body here. That's the meat, essentially, Yeah, that it can be eaten. Um, I've got to find the place here. 
Um, the tongue of a rabbit contains, of course, uh, lots of all of these things that you see are the muscle fibers. Uh, but I have to go up with the magnification, of course. And um, yeah, here I can already see it, but maybe I'm able to find a better, better one. Let's go up. So 60 times. Yeah, here we go. Okay, I'm going to show you now uh, a little bit of few things that uh, I hope that YouTube is able to have the sufficiently high resolution here. You see over here all of those muscle fibers running across. And maybe if you look very carefully, you're able to see those tiny fine stripes running perpendicular. Yeah. I don't know, maybe, maybe there are some, is a better place where you're able to find this. Um, uh, this is too dark, but these are tiny, tiny stripes. Here it's a little bit better, maybe. Yeah, Light, dark, light, dark. These are called the light and dark bands. And uh, they appear because of uh, protein fibers, filaments, so-called actin and myosin fibers, sliding past each other, um, contracting, contracting the muscle. And those muscle fibers are very interesting because they um, are made of, how many cells are they made of? That's the question, right? And you can see that uh, when you just look through the fiber like this is, I don't see that the cells are somehow separate. As a matter of fact, what you're able to see here, also a little bit difficult to see some of those darker patches that you see are, nu are the nuclei. Usually they're on the side a little bit. Is this, so what you have is, is you have essentially one cell containing hundreds of nuclei because they're all kind of fused together into one muscle fiber. Um, so that's the, again the other extreme. Here you have one, basically one cell with hundreds of nuclei, and then you had this um, this green algae over here that I just showed you before, which basically is one cell. Yeah. Um, so you see that there are a lot of these variations. Originally, uh, Robert Hooke said, "Yeah, all the, 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 the little boxes." Uh, yeah. And Schleiden and Schwann said, "All plants are made of those little boxes uh, and, yeah, and ce called cells." And then all of a sudden, we discover that there are many examples out there. Yeah, of, of, of cells like the red blood cells that don't have a nucleus. Okay, bacteria also don't have a nucleus, but they're again completely different. You've got those green algae, which basically um, are made of one cell, and but they're pretty large. Then you have those muscle fibers, which can be of uh, 30 centimeters long here. Yeah, um, yeah, which is actually one cell uh, made of hundred containing hundreds of nuclei. Uh, so. If you look in nature, you're always going to find some interesting special cases and, or, and exceptions. And that's also one of the fascinating things. It does not violate, fundamentally violate the cell theory, but uh, because it's still kind of cells, you know, that we're looking at, but it just doesn't appear the way that, that we're used to it. Right? So, um, I'm going to look uh, again uh, into some of the com comments here. Would you please discuss the functions of the various components of a cell? Okay, I can do that, but maybe not today because uh, this is a huge topic. Is the diabetic damage of insulin receptor of a cell that causes later insulin resistance? Um, there are air, uh, basically in type 1 or type 2 diabetes, uh, in one case it could be a damage in the receptor and it can also be due to autoimmune problems, what I heard. Um, and it can, oh yeah, so basically... Um, I'm not an expert on this, but um, it is indeed that the cells uh, start to lose sensitivity to insulin in type 2 diabetes. Okay, uh, Seems like a never-ending expanding universe and maybe universe has room for all life to live forever and reproduce indefinitely. Um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, okay. So th this is basically uh, just what I wanted to show you a little bit. There was, uh, was there something else that I wanted to include now? Um, there was just a second. Um, is there anything? Well, it's just the vesicles I showed you, the chloroplasts I showed you, bacteria I showed you. Yep, you know that's actually one of my favorite ones here, and the cork cells I showed you. And um, I just wanted to sh just as a um, before I, I stop, I just want to show you something else, something that I've been doing just recently, because sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to actually um, see cells. And I just want to show it to you here, just so that we do a little bit of practical work as well, for those of you who, are, <laughs> who want to do a little bit of practical work as well. Look, it is a tiny tomato here, just want to show you what I'm doing right now. Okay. And uh, how can you make the cells of a tomato visible? <laughs> All you do is the following. Just want to show you, you just remove the pulp here, and you carefully scratch off the, you carefully try to scratch off the, the pulp, 
and you want to get the skin of the tomato. Okay. Just, uh, and that actually shows uh, a little bit that, uh, yeah, sometimes in order to see cells, you just have to prepare it properly. Okay. And this is actually not so good because it's too small. You got to do this carefully. And I'm using the dull edge of the knife, as you can see here. You want to make this really thin. Okay. And uh, yeah, let's, let's give it a try here. Okay, um, if it's not thin enough, uh, you're not able to see it very well. Okay, so let's take this here and uh, let's just put it here on the slide. I hope it's thin enough. Ah, maybe not. Okay, um, we're going to take a little bit of a yeah and uh, a cover glass. Okay. Just to show you that sometimes you do not need uh, you don't need a uh, you don't need a very sharp knife. Sometimes simply the preparation technique itself uh, is enough as well. So let me quickly add this here. Then let's hope that I made it thin enough so that we're able to see the individual cells. Well, what are we able to see here? Okay, again <laughs> those nice regular round structures. Round. Well, yeah. Just wanted to show it. Uh, just wanted to, um, yeah, uh, show this to you a little bit. And you can also do this with um, other vegetables. I tried it with apples and so on. Yeah. Um, if you make uh, the specimen thin enough, then you're able to see again those cells. Yeah. And especially plant cells are very easy. Uh, can be generally easily prepared because of the large cell wall or the very thick cell wall that they have. Um, you can distinguish them um, quite quite easily from each other, right? So um, there's only one rule without it, any exceptions. There are always exceptions. Yes, <laughs> um, yeah. I really enjoyed this video with more than a bio, with um, a bit more of biological content. Uh, focus on your goal, and you will get many holes. Yeah. Um, uh, please do more of them. Well, I thank you very much uh, for the positive comment. Uh, is there a, any component a cell can live without? Hmm. Huh. That's a difficult question because if it, uh, I mean, hmm. I don't know about that. I mean, it depends on the cell. I mean, the cell has uh, these uh, the components for a reason, and if you somehow take it away artificially somehow, then most likely the cell's gonna die. Okay. Um, what you did with a tomato, can I also do it with a lemon? What I would say that with a lemon, I did not try it yet, but what you do is the following, and maybe I'm going to try this. Um, you take a, the, a very sharp knife, like the razor blade, and you cannot scratch a lemon so easily because the, the, the lemon skin is too thick, but you can try to very carefully cut a very slice, a very thin part of an orange or lemon away. Okay. Um, just a very thin part from the outside and then put that under the microscope but not scratching because um, I think the, the lemon skin, the peel is, is, is too thick. Okay, but I think uh, with a lemon, I would definitely try um, a very sharp razor blade or if you have a cutting board knife, try this as well even though I think that they're, t take a fresh one because they're a little bit dull. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, love your passion and dedication, yes, <laughs> okay. 40 years since my last biology class, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm happy that I, yeah, uh, that you were considered it interesting. Okay. Um, this can be seen in parasites, for example. Okay. It's an endoplasmic reticulum. Yep. You have to do it with an individual slices of lemon. The lemon has a very thick and waxy skin. That's correct. And red blood cell lives without a nucleus, uh, but only for 30 days. Okay. Yeah, um, people, you know what? Um, I've been now talking again uh, for one and a half hours. Again, I was a little bit worried at the beginning. I have to tell you that I'm going to run out of something to talk about. But because thanks to your questions, I think uh, we kept it quite interesting. At least it was also very interesting for me. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm just uh, going to leave it at that. What I'm going to do is uh, the following, that um, I will... Um, 
maybe do the following. I might uh, be doing, uh, every time when I do a video more, maybe on a more technical or uh, specimen preparation things, I might do it on my other channel. And maybe every time when I do a little bit more biology content, I might do it a little bit on this channel because I'm going to separate a little bit uh, uh, the contents this way uh, because I've got maybe different viewers with different interests. Um, so yeah, today it was a little bit more biology content and a little bit more biology theory. And then maybe next time I'm going to switch uh, back again to the other channel. I would also uh, like to ask you if you have not subscribed, this is pr it would be really nice if you could subscribe uh, because then you um, also get um, a notification uh, every time uh, when I'm uh, going to do an online video. Okay. Um, yeah, at some point we will keep you talking for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and if you are interested in certain topics, uh, please do tell me uh, because uh, one of the difficult things always is, is to, to think of sufficiently interesting topics. Uh, sooner or later, I've already said everything. I always know that uh, more people are joining in uh, who might have not have seen some of my previous videos, but I do want to keep the content fresh uh, all the time. Um, so if you have any suggestions, then yeah. Uh, then please uh, do tell me. Okay, I think really enough for today. Um, I'm happy that uh, the one and a half hours were kind of very uh, filled uh, without uh, me running out of um, things uh, to talk about. Um, I wish you all the best uh, for this week. Um, um, yeah, um, as always, uh, happy micro hunting. And uh, if you joined in late, the video will of course uh, be available online on YouTube. Bye-bye, have a nice week and uh, see you around.